Thank you very much for coming this evening and allowing me to share my passion for wildlife conservation with you. Before I begin, I'd like to make a few points about my presentation. First, the complete story of the sixth extinction with all its complexity can't possibly be told in an hour. What you're going to hear is a greatly simplified version. Second, we're gonna travel back in time this evening to learn about ice age extinctions. Now, you should know that there's considerable ongoing debate today among scientists regarding the cause of those ice age extinctions. I want you to know that I have studied the various competing hypotheses for these extinctions, and I'm gonna be presenting what appears to me to be the most likely cause of these extinctions. Third, the final chapter on ice age extinctions hasn't been written yet. That's because new discoveries, new information becomes available every few years that cause scientists to have to reevaluate their hypotheses. Now, what's that mean for you and me? Well, what that means is that if we were to go to a presentation on the sixth extinction 10 or 15 years from now, we might find that that presentation comes to different conclusions than the ones that I'm gonna to present today. And last, I want you to know that I'm dedicating my presentation to this bird, one whose picture you've probably never seen before and whose name you've probably never heard uttered before and regrettably one that you will never see alive, the extinct Carolina parakeet. If you remember just one thing when you leave tonight, I hope it's the Carolina parakeet. I'd encourage you when you go home to do a Google search on Carolina parakeets and do some reading about them or check a book out on the library uh, on North American extinct animals and it'll have a chapter on Carolina parakeets. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. To get an idea of the incredible abundance of wildlife that once existed in North America, we need to go back 500 years to the time when the first Europeans explorers arrived on our shores. On June 24, 1497, Italian explorer John Cabot landed at Cape Bonavista on Newfoundland Island. He wrote, quote, the land was full of white bears. In the 1500s, Polar bears were even spotted as far south as Cape Cod. As the explorers pushed inland, they discovered an almost unbroken forest that stretched from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. Legend had it that a squirrel on the East Coast could jump from tree to tree to tree all the way to the Mississippi River without ever touching the ground. And in those trees were passenger pigeons the most numerous birds on earth, comprising nearly 40% of the entire bird population of North America. In the fall of 1823, John James Audubon wrote of traveling from Hardinsburg, Kentucky to Louisville, 55 miles away, when a flock of passenger pigeons filled the sky so that, quote, the light of the noonday sun was obscured as by an eclipse. He stopped to count the number of flocks, but soon quit when he realized the futility of trying to count a never-ending procession of birds. Audubon calculated that a single flock contained 1.1 billion birds, and he had counted 163 flocks in just 21 minutes. He reached Louisville around sunset and wrote that the passenger pigeons, quote, were still passing in undiminished numbers and continued to do so for three days in succession. Another prolific bird that Audubon was familiar with was the Carolina parakeet. While most parrots live in the Southern Hemisphere, Carolina parakeets were found as far north as the Great Lakes, giving them the northernmost range of any member of the parrot family. Their range included most Eastern states, as well as along riparian corridors west of the Mississippi River, all the way into eastern Colorado. Beavers were widespread throughout North America, far beyond anything we can possibly imagine today, when their dams were found virtually every half mile on every stream and every watershed in the continent. It's estimated the beaver population was 400 million when the first Europeans arrived. 
Now to put this into perspective, the US human population today is about 330 million. When the first European explorers arrived in the West, prairie dogs occupied 100 million acres of grasslands and their population was estimated to be 5 billion. As recently as 1905, Vernon Bailey, the chief field naturalist for the US Biological Survey, reported surveying a prairie dog town in Texas that was 260 miles long by 100 miles wide and covered 16 million acres. He estimated the single prey dog town contained 400 million prairie dogs. Now I want to introduce you to a category of animals called megafauna. And you'll need to remember this because I'm going to use this term a lot. Megafauna are land animals that weigh more than 100 pounds, like these elk. In the 1500s, Wolves were the most widespread megafauna in North America, with two million of them living across the continent. With the exception of Baja California, wolves were found in every state and province of the US, Canada, and Mexico. Grizzly bears were found in every state west of the 100th meridian. The red line shown here that divides the green eastern half of the country from the arid western half. It's estimated the North American population of grizzlies was 100,000 when Europeans first arrived on the continent. Bighorn sheep were widespread throughout the West with their population estimated to be 2 million when the first explorers arrived. In his book, Journal of a Trapper, Osborne Russell casually mentions seeing a herd of thousands of bighorn, bighorns in Wyoming in 1835 as if it was just an everyday occurrence. In Osborne Russell's time, there were an estimated 30 million pronghorn that roamed the grasslands west of the Mississippi River. But if there was one species that symbolized the seemingly unlimited wildlife in our country, bison would surely be it. At the time of European arrival to North America, 30 million bison, or buffalo as they are more commonly called, were found in nearly every state of the country. They were also found in five Canadian provinces. They were so numerous in 1868 that a train crossing Kansas traveling 100, traveled 120 miles along a continuous herd of buffalo estimated to contain four million animals. In 1871, an army officer wrote of traveling across Kansas when, quote, the train entered a large buffalo herd. As we went on, the thicker they became until the very earth appeared to be a rolling mass of humps so far as we could see. Suddenly, some of the animals turned and charged. Others fell in behind them, and down on us they came like an avalanche. The engineer stopped the train while we fired from the platforms and windows with rifles and revolvers. But it was like trying to stop a tidal wave. The buffalo plunged heads down into the train. So great was the crush of buffalo, they toppled over three railroad cars. Twice in one week, other trains were also derailed by charging buffalo, whose numbers it was impossible to compute." End of quote. Could animals so numerous it was impossible to count them ever go extinct? To find out what early Americans were thinking about this question, let's go to Monticello in the year 1787. Monticello was the country estate of Thomas Jefferson. During Jefferson time, science was heavily influenced by religion. People believed that God created all life by following a divine plan. According to the religious and scientific dogma of the time, no species had ever gone extinct, nor ever would because that would indicate a flaw in God's plan. And of course, God wouldn't have a flawed plan. Therefore, the only logical conclusion you could come to was that extinction simply wasn't possible. Consistent with this belief, Jefferson wrote, such is the economy of nature that no instance can be produced of her having permitted any one race of her animals to become extinct, of her having formed any link in her great work so weak as to be broken. By 1800s, 
By the 1800s, scientists were beginning to discover the fossilized animals, remains of animals. Jefferson's fossil collection included what he thought were fossil bones of a mammoth and the claw of a giant lion. Since extinction was not believed possible, he thought the fossils must be from living animals that still roam the earth somewhere, probably in the great unknown western part of the continent. Consequently, he instructed Lewis and Clark to search for live mammoths and giant lions on their expedition. Now just imagine it's 1804, you've joined Lewis and Clark's core discovery and you're traveling on an expedition of the American West. Can you even begin to imagine the enormous populations of wildlife they saw? Yet, despite the incredible display of wildlife seen by early explorers such as Lewis and Clark, they were actually seeing an impoverished landscape that had lost most of its megafauna to extinction in the recent past. How can this be possible? Let's dig it a little deeper and see what we can find. Around the time of Jefferson, a French scientist named Georges Cuvier compared fossil elephant bones to bones from living elephant species. And he found that the fossil elephant was taller, had a shorter tail, longer, more curved tusks, and a different shaped skull that came to a point on top leading him to conclude that the fossils weren't from any living species of elephant that he knew. But unlike Jefferson, Cuvier was convinced there were no great unknown places remaining on Earth where an animal as large as an elephant had gone undiscovered. So in 1812, he published his findings that extinction actually did occur, and thereafter, extinction became an established fact. So what does the fossil record tell us? 99% of all species that have ever lived on Earth are now extinct. Extinction is the norm, and survival is the exception. It tells us the Earth has experienced five mass extinctions in the past. What's a mass extinction? Well, it's when more than 50% of Earth's species go extinct in less than one million years, and the extinctions are global. Let's look at the Earth's five mass extinctions. The first mass extinction occurred 445 million years ago at the end of the geological period called the Ordovician, when 85% of all species on Earth went extinct due to climate change. The Ordovician mass extinction was followed, as are all mass extinctions, by evolution repopulating the planet with a new set of diverse species over the course of millions of years. Then, 71 million years after the Ordovician extinction, climate change struck again, causing the extinction of 80% of all species at the end of the Devonian period. The third mass extinction is known as the Great Dying because life on Earth was nearly wiped out at the end of the Permian period 252 million years ago when 95% of all species on Earth went extinct due to global warming of 11 degrees Fahrenheit. In the fourth mass extinction, 76% of all species went extinct at the end of the Triassic period 201 million years ago due to global warming of nine degrees Fahrenheit. The fifth mass extinction is the one that we're all familiar with when dinosaurs went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period 65 million years ago. This is believed to be the result of global temperatures dropping 13 degrees after an asteroid impact with Earth created a worldwide dust cloud that obscured the sun for months, causing a temporary halt to photosynthesis, killing, killing most plants, and leaving virtually nothing for animals to eat. Have you heard of the sixth extinction? Most scientists believe that it's happening right now. This belief stems from the fact that the fossil record tells us Earth's megafauna began to disappear beginning approximately 47,000 years ago and continues to this day. The sixth extinction began during the Pleistocene epoch, which is also called the Ice Age. 
The Pleistocene began 2.6 million years ago and ended just 11,000 years ago. It was followed by the Holocene epoch, which is the current geological time period in which we live. Scientists predict it's unlikely any of Earth's largest mammals, those over 2,000 pounds, will survive the sixth extinction. It's also likely we'll lose 100% of the Earth's megafauna predators, 50% of the remaining vertebrates, and 50% of the Earth's plants. Let's look at the two most likely scenarios for the start of the sixth extinction. Climate change is an obvious possibility that needs to be considered, since it appears this may have been the cause of the five previous mass extinctions. The second hypothesis we'll investigate is called overkill. Let's look at climate change first. According to this hypothesis, temperatures were warming at the end of the Pleistocene. This caused the continental glaciers that covered most of Canada to recede as the Ice Age was coming to an end. Wildlife unable to adapt to the warming temperatures and shifting vegetation patterns went extinct. However, this doesn't make much sense because there were four major ice ages during the Pleistocene, each followed by a warming period called an interglacial. The first three ice ages and interglacials had more extreme climate, colder ice ages and warmer interglacials than the fourth. Yet the megafauna survived the first three. Therefore, it seems illogical that they wouldn't have survived the milder climate of the fourth ice age and interglacial but they didn't. In addition, climate change should have caused extinction equally among all species, but that's not what happened. Virtually all plants, insects, reptiles, amphibians, fish, birds, and small mammals survived. North American extinctions at the end of the Pleistocene were almost exclusively megafauna. The second hypothesis that attempts to explain Ice Age extinctions is called Overkill. In his 2005 book titled Twilight of the Mammoths, Dr. Paul Martin, a paleoecologist from the University of Arizona, describes how prehistoric humans left the trail of extinction as they hunted, migrated, and expanded throughout much of the Earth. To test this hypothesis, Let's look at the global human migration out of Africa to see how human activities may have impacted wildlife populations. The red area in Africa shows where humans originated, and the red lines with arrows shows the direction humans migrated throughout the world. You can see that humans migrated to the Mideast approximately 100,000 years ago, Southern Asia 70,000 years ago, Europe 40,000 years ago, and Northern Asia 25,000 years ago. At the same time, humans expanded throughout much of the globe. Populations of large animals disappeared from the earth. Was this a deadly coincidence or evidence supporting the overkill hypothesis? Let's begin by looking at Australia. The first humans arrived in Australia approximately 47,000 years ago. 4,000 years later, 85% of the megafauna were extinct. Humans arrived in North America 15,500 years ago. 4,500 years later, 77% of the megafauna were extinct. In South America, the first humans arrived 14,500 years ago. 7,000 years later, 80% of the megafauna were extinct. Humans arrived in Madagascar 2,000 years ago. 1,500 years later, most large animals, including elephant birds, hippopotamus, giant lemurs, and giant tortoises were extinct. The first humans arrived in New Zealand just 720 years ago. Now, New Zealand had no native animals except for bats. It was, however, the home of moas. These were giant, flightless birds with the largest species standing 12 feet tall and weighing 500 pounds. After thriving for millions of years, 
All nine species of moa abruptly went extinct within 120 years of human arrival. The trend is quite clear. Shortly after humans migrate to an unoccupied territory, large animals begin to disappear, and the larger they are, the less likely they'll survive our presence. Now I want to narrow our focus onto North America, which I'll define as everything north of the Tropic of Cancer. Let's further focus in on the area around Alaska. Beginning 50,000 years ago, and continuing to as recently as 11,000 years ago, the entire area inside these, this dashed, dashed line was dry land. We call this area Beringia. Beringia formed when ocean levels dropped 300 feet due to global cooling during the last ice age when much of the Earth's water was stored on land in the form of snow and ice. Beringia, also called the Bering Land Bridge, was a 1,000 mile wide area of land that connected Asia with North America. People living in Asia moved into Beringia where they lived for thousands of years. Then approximately 15,500 years ago, scientists hypothesized that some residents in Beringia got in their small boats and began making their way south along the coast on what we now call the Kelp Highway. From there, some of these people moved inland, spreading east across North America. Today, we call their descendants Native Americans. Now, during the Ice Age, glaciers two miles thick covered most of Canada. Then, around 12,600 years ago, the glaciers began to melt, allowing a second wave of humans from Beringia to migrate to North America, walking this time via an inland ice-free corridor that opened up along the front range of the Canadian Rockies. So what did the first Americans see? African-looking megafauna, including lions, cheetahs, camels, zebras, rhinoceros, and elephants. Altogether, there were five species of North American elephants. They included the California dwarf mammoth, the gomphothir, which strictly speaking is not an elephant, but is closely related, the mastodon, woolly mammoth, and the Columbian mammoth. There were seven species of giant ground sloths, ranging from Mexico to Alaska. The smallest weighed 600 pounds, with the largest weighing nearly 8,000 pounds. Now to put this in perspective, the six sloth species that survive today in Central and South America all weigh less than 20 pounds. The glymphodont was a giant armadillo the size of a Volkswagen Beetle that weighed 4,400 pounds. Toxodonts stood five feet tall, weighed 3,300 pounds, and looked like a cross between a rhinoceros and a hippopotamus. Giant short-faced bears were widespread throughout most of North America south of the continental glaciers. Larger than today's polar bear, giant short-faced bears tip the scale at up to 2,600 pounds. Now, for comparison, a male Colorado black bear averages 275 pounds. There were seven species of giant cats during the Pleistocene, including the saber-toothed cat. They included the American lion at twice the size of today's African lion, the saber-toothed cat, Another type of saber-toothed cat called a scimitar cat, the jaguar, two species of cheetah, and the mountain lion. Even beavers were gigantic. <laughs> While giant beavers averaged 220 pounds, Fossils have been found that indicate some weighed as much as 350 pounds. Altogether, there were 74 species of Pleistocene megafauna when the first humans arrived in North America 15,500 years ago. 
4,500 years later, just 17 species of megafauna survived. Here are those 17 species in larger print, so it's easier to read them. Notice that the megafauna that survived the Pleistocene are the same ones that exist today. So to summarize, 74 species of megafauna existed 15,500 years ago. It appears humans were directly or indirectly responsible for 57 of these species, or 77%, going extinct by 11,000 years ago, leaving just 17 species of megafauna that have survived to this day. This is the impoverished landscape that I mentioned earlier that European explorers encountered when they arrived in North America. Which raises the question, how did humans kill such large animals? The first humans developed razor-sharp stone points and attached them to the end of spears and atlatls and used them for hunting. We call these sharpened stone tips Clovis points from the location where they were first discovered near Clovis, New Mexico. Knowledge of how to make Clovis points spread like wildfire from clan to clan to clan, and in a very short time they were being used throughout North America. Now, this is an atlatl, also called a launching stick. The atlatl predates the bow and arrow as a weapon by thousands of years. It consists of an 18 inch piece of wood with a hook on the left end. A dart is then made of a long wooden shaft with the left end hollowed out so it can be loosely inserted into the hook of the atlatl. A clovis point is then attached to the other end of the dart. The purpose of the atlatl is to lengthen your arm, which acts as a lever when launching the dart. Increasing the lever or excuse me, increasing the length of the lever causes the end of the atlatl to move with increased speed and power, causing the dart to travel farther, faster, and deliver more killing power than if you were just throwing a spear like a javelin. So rather than risking your life by having to get within inches of an angry woolly mammoth to thrust your spear into its side, the atlatl allowed a hunter to accurately deliver his weapon at speeds of 90 miles an hour from a much safer distance of 30 yards away. Now it's unlikely the first Americans caused the extinction of all 57 species of megafauna by hunting them down and killing them all. While direct evidence of what happened is scant, circumstantial evidence indicates that humans killed herbivores faster than they could reproduce. This resulted in a downward population spiral that ultimately led to their extinction. It would have been unusual, however, for humans to hunt predators. Predators probably followed herbivores into extinction as they died of starvation when their prey was eliminated. Regardless of whether a species was killed directly or indirectly by humans, it appears that 77% of megafauna, including the saber-toothed cat, went extinct in North America within 2,000 years of humans developing Clovis points. In geologic, geologic time, they were gone in the blink of an eye. Were Pleistocene megafauna extinctions caused by climate change or overkill? After surviving extreme climate fluctuations in the Pleistocene, it seems unlikely that 57 species of megafauna would have gone extinct in such a short period of time had humans not arrived in North America. According to Dr. Paul Martin, virtually all extinctions of wild animals in the past 50,000 years have been caused by humans. Why should we care about Pleistocene extinctions? Because knowledge of Pleistocene megafauna extinctions makes us realize how precious our surviving wildlife is and sharpens our focus on saving the rem remnant wildlife populations that remain. Let's look at how we're doing when it comes to saving our remaining wildlife by checking in to see what's happened since the arrival of Europeans. In the 1800s, the belief in manifest destiny resulted in millions of people migrating west. 
this mass migration had terrible consequences for America's wildlife, including the slaughter of millions of animals. What were the results? Passenger pigeons were slaughtered by the hundreds of thousands at a time, causing them to go extinct by 1914. Carolina parakeets were shot into extinction by the 1930s. Beaver populations have been reduced by 97% due to trapping. And prey dogs have been shot and poisoned, eliminating them from 99% of their range. Polar bears have been placed on a threatened species list because their range is diminishing rapidly due to global warming, melting the sea ice on which the bears depend for hunting seals. Wolves have been persecuted for centuries. They've been poisoned, shot, and trapped. Today, less than 6,000 remain in the contiguous states. The grizzly bear population has been reduced by 97% to 1,500 in the contiguous U.S. Yet despite the small population, Idaho and Wyoming want to restart a hunting season for the first time in 40 years. As this ancient Pueblo and rock art seems to indicate, bighorn sheep were abundant 800 years ago. Since that time, bighorn sheep populations have been reduced by 97% and their range severely restricted by domestic sheep grazing. When bighorn sheep come into contact with domestic sheep, bighorns die of pneumonia transmitted by the domestic sheep. This is because bighorn sheep have no immunity to the diseases carried by the domestic sheep, and the infection of even a single bighorn results in, in pneumonia spreading like wildfire throughout the bighorn population. This is a photo of, of buffalo skulls on the prairie in the 1800s. During the 13-year killing spree from 1870 to 1883, you could walk 100 miles along the railroad tracks without ever stepping off of a rotting buffalo carcass. By 1902, just 23 buffalo remained in the wild of the 30 million that existed just a century before. This is an aerial photo of pivot irrigation farm fields in Kansas. This was formerly the habitat for prey dogs, wolves, elk, grizzly bears, deer, bison, and pronghorn. The pronghorn population has been reduced by 97% due to the wildlife slaughter of the 1800s, combined with the loss of habitat in the 1900s. As this photo shows, very little home on the range remains where the deer and the antelope play. Since the pilgrims landed in 1620, nearly 500 species of plants and animals are known to have gone extinct in the U.S. The rate of extinction in the past 400 years is unprecedented. A report by the World Wildlife Fund found that 70% of our planet's wildlife populations have been exterminated since 1970. Simply put, we're annihilating Earth's wildlife. To demonstrate this, let's look at Earth's land mammals by weight at the end of the Ice Age. 11,000 years ago, wildlife made up 99% of Earth's land mammals by weight. Humans, on the other hand, and our pets and domestic livestock made up just 1%. Today, when we add together the weight of all the people on the planet, plus the weight of our pets, and domestic livestock, we find they make up 97% of all the mammals on Earth. Wild mammals make up just 3%. This slide shows the number of species currently listed as threatened and endangered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. As you can see, there are currently 1,661 species threatened with extinction in the U.S. In the most comprehensive study ever conducted, the United Nations Global Assessment on Biodiversity recently reported that one million species of plants and animals are threatened with extinction worldwide, many within decades. With the exception of when dinosaurs went extinct, plants and animals are going extinct at a faster rate today 
than at any time in the Earth's past. Extinction is a natural phenomenon, with scientists estimating the normal rate that species go extinct is somewhere between one to five species per year. In contrast, the current global rate of extinction is estimated to be 1,000 species per year. As a result, we're now in the middle of an extinction crisis. Despite the small size of the remaining population of wild plants and animals, the diversity of life on Earth is still amazing. According to the latest scientific estimates, as many as 8 million different species of life may share the Earth with us. And this doesn't include the millions of single-celled species like bacteria that we'll probably never be able to identify. From a practical viewpoint, there are many reasons why we must do everything we can to prevent extinction. Biological diversity provides us with resources that we can't live without, such as food, fertile soil to grow our crops, crop pollination and pest control, clean air and water, building materials, stabilization of Earth's climate, pharmaceuticals, and decomposition and recycling of organic matter. Diminishing biodiversity is a tragedy that should be a concern to all of us because we're eliminating opportunities to improve our health and welfare through yet undiscovered foods, medicines, and raw materials for industrial use. In addition to utilitarian reasons for protecting biodiversity, there are also religious reasons for preventing extinctions. Reverend Hess Cox of the Evangelical Environmental Network writes, quote, it's a matter of life for us. Everything we do to mess up God's creation impacts human life. For us, it's a pro-life issue. Pope Francis writes, the great majority of species become extinct for reasons related to human activity. Because of us, thousands of species will no longer give glory to God by their very existence. We have no such right. And the head of the Greek Orthodox Church writes, for human beings to destroy the biological diversity in God's creation is a sin. For non-religious folks, protecting creation is an important moral and ethical issue. People in this group believe that human-caused extinction is a serious ethical transgression as deeply felt as a sin would felt be felt by a person of faith. They believe we must preserve biodiversity because we have a responsibility to future generations. We are obligated to speak out to those that don't have a voice and our political system. And lastly, all species have an intrinsic right to exist. In other words, a species has its own right to exist and it really doesn't matter what you and I think about it. Both religious and non-religious folks share the belief that plants and animals or the creation is sacred and we're obligated to preserve and protect all species. Now, there have been three phases of the sixth extinction in North America. I talked about the first two, Pleistocene megafauna overkill and the wildlife slaughter of the 1800s and 1900s. Now I want to discuss the third phase, loss of habitat in the 20th and 21st centuries. With humans using 72% of Earth's ice-free land surface to provide for our food and shelter, little habitat remains for wildlife. What causes the loss of wildlife habitat? Well, there are two primary causes. The first is human population growth. Two and a half people are added to the world's population every second. That translates to 216 people being added to the Earth every day. That's the equivalent of adding 79 million people to the earth every year. The equivalent of adding a new country with a population the size of Germany to earth every year. Now it took all of human history until the year 1800 to reach the first 1 billion people. 
When my mother was born in 1930, there were two billion people on Earth. In 1960, when I was six years old, there were three billion people. And in my lifetime, another 4.6 billion people have been added to the world, bringing the population to 7.6 billion. Experts project Earth's population will continue to increase to 10 billion in the next 38 years. Now let's narrow our focus on U.S. population growth. The U.S. is the third most populated nation in the world behind China and India. With the U.S. adding one person every 18 seconds, our population is projected to increase from the current 330 million to 439 million by 2050. The second cause of loss of habitat is our excessive consumption of natural resources through agriculture, grazing, logging, mining, drilling, urban sprawl, over shopping, and the desire to own things we really don't need. Our overconsumption of resources results in an area of wildlife habitat the size of a football field disappearing every two and a half minutes from the western U.S. When it comes to overpopulation, over, excuse me, when it comes to overconsumption, we lead the world. The U.S. makes up 5% of the world's population, but consumes 25% of its resources. If everyone consumed resources like Americans, we would need nearly five planets to provide all of the raw materials. Now, to prevent extinction, very large areas of wildlands must be protected in their natural state. Perhaps the best measure of an area's wildness is the absence of roads. As you can see from this map of remaining roadless areas in the contiguous U.S., we've done a poor job of protecting large, wild areas for nature. If you find it hard to believe how few wild lands remain, take a look at this NASA photo from outer space taken at night. You may be surprised to learn that we've protected just 5% of our land in the lower 48 states in parks, wildlife refuges, and wilderness areas, compared to 16% in Tanzania, 25% in Costa Rica, 27% in Germany, and 30% in New Zealand. Today, 95% of our country is available for residential, agricultural, or resource development, while just 5% has been set aside for the protection of nature. Striking a balance between protection and development is getting increasingly harder when we have a continually growing population with a never-ending appetite for consuming resources. According to the mining industry, every baby born in America will need 3.1 million pounds of minerals, metals, and fuels in their lifetime. Where would these come from? How will we extract them without going into the roadless areas and further destroying biological diversity? Well, there's a lot of debate these days about where we need to focus our effort in solving this problem. Some say we need to reduce our population. Others say that's nonsense. We just need to reduce our consumption. Let's look at two families to see if we can find the answer. Family one focuses on population reduction by having just one child while well, family two, two focuses on reducing their consumption by 30% while having the average of two children. Now to keep things simple, we'll ignore the original parents and look only at the consumption of true resources by the children of four generations. The number of cars they'll purchase over their lifetime and the number of gallons of gas it will take to fuel these cars. We can see from this table that at the end of four generations Family one has produced four children, purchased 28 cars, and consumed 124,000 gallons of gasoline. Meanwhile, family two has, pr has produced 30 children, purchased 140 cars, and consumed 466,000 gallons of gasoline. From this example, 
you can see that the best way to reduce overconsumption is to reduce the number of consumers. This isn't to suggest that we should ignore excessive consumption. We should be aggressively pursuing reductions in population and consumption simultaneously. But our primary focus should be on reducing population growth. So what causes loss of habitat? The more people there are, the more resources we consume, the more wildlife habitat we destroy, the more wildlife becomes at risk of extinction. You don't have to be a scientist to see the obvious. The primary causes of the sixth extinction are human population growth and expansion throughout the planet combined with our excessive consumption of natural resources. Overpopulation is the root cause of our most pressing environmental problems. If our goal is to live sustainably, then we must be honest with ourselves and admit there's simply more people alive today than the Earth has the resources to support at US levels of consumption. Reducing our population is the only way we'll ever successfully solve all the other environmental issues shown here. Let me demonstrate this by having us look at each of these issues shown starting at 12 o'clock with species extinction and ask this question. If we reduce the world's population, would this go a long way in reducing the number of species at risk of extinction? The answer is yes. Moving clockwise, if we reduce the world's population, would this go a long way towards reducing the threat of climate change? With fewer people burning fossil fuels, the answer is yes. What about loss of habitat? If we had fewer people on the planet, would this reduce habitat loss? Of course it would. In fact, we'd have areas that could return to their natural condition, recreating additional wildlife habitat, a process called rewilding. If I were to continue around the circle, we'd get the same results for each issue. Reduce population and solving the other issues gets easier. Increase population and solving the other environmental issues becomes impossible, regardless of how much time money, and people power we allocate to solving them. Let me demonstrate this further by moving climate change to the center. As you hear from the news, climate change appears to be the most important issue of our time. Now let me ask you this question. If I could wave a magic wand and solve the issue of climate change by suddenly producing 100% of the world's energy from renewable energy resources, would this go a long way towards solving all of these environmental issues? The answer is that it wouldn't help mitigate three of these, but it would do nothing whatsoever to reduce overpopulation, loss of habitat, famine, deforestation, urban sprawl, water pollution, overfishing, running out of farmland, or overconsumption of resources. Let's not kid ourselves. It's not possible to stop global warming without reducing human population. This isn't to suggest that we should ignore climate change. To the contrary, if we don't reduce our use of fossil fuels to, the, to near zero in the next decade, Earth's average temperature will likely increase by 9 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of this century. This will end civilization as we know it. We should be aggressively pursuing a switch over to renewable, non-polluting energy as quickly as possible. But we must remember, the best way to reduce our use of fossil fuels is by reducing the number of people using fossil fuels. As you can see, the solution is really simple. The most important action we need to take to end the sixth extinction is to stabilize our population as quickly as possible and then begin reducing our numbers to a sustainable level. We hear a lot of talk these days that we need to live a more sustainable lifestyle. But what does this mean? What is sustainability? Sustainability is living in a way that doesn't negatively impact the ability of current and future generations of all Earth species to thrive. How do we get to sustainability? We must develop the will to deal with overpopulation. This requires us to confront an issue we'd rather avoid talking about because it's not politically correct and makes us feel uncomfortable. We can no longer afford the luxury of silence when it comes to overpopulation. 
Now, I frequently hear people say that overpopulation is a problem in Asia or Africa, but not in the US. I want to dispel this myth. To do this, we need to learn the definition of the term carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is the maximum population size of a species that a specific geographic area can sustain indefinitely. Earth's human carrying capacity is directly related to our level of consumption, or in other words, our standard of living. Simply put, the Earth can support more people living in hopeless poverty or fewer people living the way we do. Remember what I said a minute ago. If everyone consumed resources like Americans, we'd need five planets to provide all the raw materials. The bottom line is this. Based on carrying capacity and our levels of consumption, the US is the most overpopulated nation on the planet. After learning that we're in the middle of an extinction crisis, people often ask, is it too late to save creation? Absolutely not. While populations of plants and animals are but tiny remnants of their former numbers, most species still remain to be saved. And as long as they still exist, there's hope. To save creation, we must learn to live sustainably, accept personal responsibility for being part of the solution, and act with a sense of urgency. As Naomi Klein writes in her book, This Changes Everything, no one is coming to save us. It's up to you and me. With this in mind, I'd like to offer you my Earth Survival Manual with a list of the most important actions we need to take to live sustainably in the sixth extinction and ensure human survival. We've learned today that the two primary causes of the sixth extinction, beginning in the ice age and continuing through today, are human, over, human population growth and overconsumption of resources. If we have the courage to implement the actions described in the Earth Survival Manual, then we'll be well on our way towards a sustainable future. First, we need to reduce our population and the number of consumers. A number of population experts suggest the US population should be no more than 150 million, our population in the 1940s. To accomplish this, each of us needs to voluntarily choose to have a small family. Of course, the best way to live sustainably is not to have any children, a path my wife and I have chosen. However, if your soul searching leads you to decide your life would not be whole without having your own biological children, then I'd strongly encourage you to stop at one child. After that, if you want to raise more children, adopt those in need of a loving home. To reduce your consumption of resources, buy only what you need, not things you want. Think twice before shopping and ask yourself, do I really need this? We must end our addiction to fossil fuels. A typical family's largest consumption of fossil fuels results from powering their home and driving their car. If you own a home, go solar by installing solar electric and solar hot water panels. Next, make a commitment to walk, bike, or take public transportation whenever possible. Make driving your last choice. If you must have a car, buy one that gets the highest number of miles per gallon. Better yet, Purchase an electric car for your next vehicle and charge it using your solar panels. Take extinction off your plate by reducing your meat and dairy consumption. A plant-based diet is healthier for you and better for the earth. Animal agriculture uses immense amounts of land, water, pesticides, and fossil fuels, making it one of the leading causes of biodiversity loss. Today, 70% of the world's agricultural land is dedicated to animal production, and the world's five largest meat and dairy companies combined are responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than any of the world's largest oil and gas companies. Now, individual actions alone won't solve overpopulation and overconsumption. We also need major policy reforms from our federal government. I want to emphasize the policy reforms I'm proposing are not from a liberal or conservative perspective. These reforms ignore politics 
and outline what has to be done and done quickly if we're going to save all of Earth's inhabitants. First is the creation of tax incentives to encourage one-child families and discourage large families. While no government has the right to forcibly tell its citizens how many children they can have, government does have the right and the responsibility to implement policies that encourage behavior that benefits society and discourages behavior that is detrimental to society. We need to strive for zero net migration. This means the number of people we allow to immigrate into the country equals the number of people who leave the U.S. each year to live in another country. Currently, more people come to the U.S. each year than leave. Since 1986, immigration has averaged around a million people annually. This has added 34 million people to our population and made immigration the primary driver of population growth in the U.S. If we continue to allow in-migration to exceed out-migration by 1 million people every year, this will add another 80 million people to our population by the end of the century. The best way to ensure that immigration doesn't lead to an increase in U.S. population, the loss of our wildlands, and the extinction of thousands of North American plants and animals is through a policy of zero net migration. We must eliminate fossil fuel subsidies. The U.S. taxpayer subsidizes the fossil fuel industry to the tune of $20 billion per year. These subsidies lower the price of coal, oil, and gas, encourage our overconsumption and addiction to these fossil fuels, and prevent the renewable energy from taking over the energy marketplace. We must reduce our military spending by 50%. The U.S. military's carbon footprint is enormous and must be reduced in order to have a substantial impact on our overconsumption of fossil fuels and to reduce our impact of, uh, excuse me, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Our military uses 12.6 million gallons of fuel every day and is responsible for 93% of all U.S government fuel consumption, making it the largest single user of fossil fuels in the world. At, excuse me, at $717 billion per year, military spending represents more than 54% of our federal government's budget. We spend four times more on our military than the second biggest spender, China, and 15 times more than Russia. We can cut our military spending by 50% and still spend more than twice as much as the world's second highest nation spends on their military. Now let me make one thing clear. I'm not naive. I recognize there's evil in the world and we need to be able to defend ourselves. I believe in a strong military to protect our homeland. But it's unnecessary and foolish to spend $143 billion each year more than the combined total of the next nine military spending countries of the world. Money that would be better spent preserving life on Earth and ensuring our survival. World-renowned biologist E.O. Wilson recommends setting aside 50% of the Earth for the protection of nature. I strongly urge you to get involved in working with local, state, and national conservation organizations to demand the federal government protect 50% of the U.S. land by creating more parks, wildlife refuges, wilderness areas, and wildlife corridors. Today, America stands at a fork in the road. The two roads before us couldn't be more different. If we take the path of least resistance, We'll go down the road of continued population growth and excessive consumption of resources, leading to the extinction of our wildlife while putting our own lives in jeopardy. The other road leads to a smaller, happier, and healthier population living sustainably in communities surrounded by wildlands and abundant wildlife. These are the only choices before us. 
While the task appears daunting, I have no doubt that we can achieve it. Let me give you a few examples of what can be achieved in a short period of time when we set our minds to it. In 1973, scientists discovered that the use of chlorofluorocarbons in aerosol sprays and refrigerants had created a thinning in the ozone layer of the atmosphere over Antarctica, shown here in blue, and it was growing larger every year. This depleted the ozone layer and called, caused excessive radiation to reach the Earth, and if it continued to grow, had the potential for ending most life on the planet. The international community came together in 1987 and signed a treaty called the Montreal Protocol. This treaty was to protect the ozone layer by phasing out the production of ozone-depleting chemicals. As a result of this agreement, the ozone layer is slowly recovering and expected to return to normal by 2050. The adoption and implementation of the Montreal Protocol has been the most successful international agreement ever created and demonstrates what can be accomplished when the countries of the world recognize a serious problem and commit to resolving it quickly. Closer to the home, the US has proven time and time again we can accomplish anything we set our minds to. For example, nine months before the US had even put its first astronaut in orbit around the Earth, President Kennedy had the audacity to announce on May 25, 1961, that the US would land people on the moon and return them home safely by the end of the decade. Seven months, excuse me, seven years and nine months later, we did it. On the local level, residents in the North Fork Valley where I live formed an organization 10 years ago called Citizens for a Healthy Community. This organization was formed to fight climate change by trying to stop oil and gas development in our area. With just 500 members, we were able to do something that had never done before up to this point. We forced the Bureau of Land Management to withdraw their proposed 30,000 acre oil and gas lease sale that would have allowed gas drilling right next door to our homes, churches, and schools. It's truly amazing what a group of committed citizens can do when they dedicate themselves to a task. To be equally successful in achieving our goals of living sustainably and saving creation, we need to be inspired and highly motivated. The best way I know to do this is to look inward and ask yourself, who or what do you love so much that you're willing to make some lifestyle changes for their benefit? your children, your grandchildren, or perhaps your love of nature. So in conclusion, I'd like to tell you what inspires and motivates me to strive to live sustainably and work to save creation. My motivation can't be explained by scientific facts, but rather by an emotional experience I had on a rainy Alaskan day in 1985 when I saw a grizzly bear for the first time. I'll never forget the beauty of that bear, nor will I forget the heart-pounding excitement I felt seeing this magnificent animal. While watching this bear, it occurred to me that grizzly bears, like all species being wiped out by humans, had done nothing to deserve the fate that humans were forcing on it. What's more, I knew I would be profoundly saddened to live in a world without grizzlies. At that moment, I realized I must fight for this bear, since despite its incredible strength, it was absolutely helpless before the increasing number of people that were pressing in on all sides of its shrinking habitat. Its fate is in our hands. 